the next uh, panel, it's it's about women in sports. This is something that really gets me excited. We're going to be talking about the business of women in sports, which is so multifaceted and has an increasing visibility in the last years. And things are going to keep going uh, better. We're going to talk about monetization. We're going to talk about the business side of it. But we're also going to talk about the passion and the discipline that everybody needs to have uh, to be in that field. I think we have everybody here ready. Let me see if I confirm with my team, you know, that we have a lot of things going on over here. So I got to confirm that everybody's here with us. And so, yes, we're, I'm going to introduce them and then you're going to enjoy this amazing panel. We're going to welcome now Lisa Brommel, owner of the four times WNBA champions, Seattle Storms. Also with us today, Haley Rosen, the founder and CEO of Just Women's Sports. Also welcoming today the WNBA All-Star and VP of Business Development, Marisa Coleman. And she's going to be, who is going to be moderating this panel today is Jamie Messler, the CEO and founder in, of Gaming Society. So please enjoy Discipline Lessons of Women in Sports. Welcome, everyone. Did Jamie not make it? <laughs> oh no, technical issues. Okay, I think that Jamie disappeared all of a sudden. We know this happens. It's a live show, everyone. Welcome again. How are you guys doing? Let me start the conversation. Marisa, Haley, and Lisa, thanks, you, thanks for being here today. Thanks, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yes. Um, so, well, I think I'm going to start the conversation. Jamie was supposed to do it, but let's talk about this. Um, of course, can you tell a little bit about your background in sports, each and one of you? Uh, I can I can kick it off. So um, I just retired from a 10-year WNBA career. I uh, played for Washington Mystics, Los Angeles Sparks, um, Indiana Fever, and then I finished with the New York Liberty. Um, great, great time, great career. Um, went to University of Maryland um, and now um, VP of uh, Business Development for Gaming Society. So really excited to, to have this conversation and, and be on a panel with, with such accomplished women. Thank you for being here, Maria. So that's so exciting. Haley? Uh, um, kind of a similar story. I was a soccer player. I played soccer in college and then played professionally for a little bit in the U.S. and abroad. Um, I, you know, that experience really showed me the momentum that was happening in women's sports when I was playing. You know, we were playing in front of packed stadiums. Attendance was up. Viewership was up. Sponsorships were up. We were just seeing this space come to life and build momentum and really getting the opportunity to see that firsthand led me to starting now Just Women Sports, which is what I do. I'm the founder and CEO of Just Women Sports. It's exactly what the name sounds like. Um, you know, our whole thing is that 4% of sports coverage is dedicated to women's sports, and that basically makes no sense at all, just given the interest and the momentum in the space. And so we're here to bring you women's sports. Yes, amazing. Thank you, Haley. Hi, Lisa. Hi. So back in the day, I was also a collegiate <laughs> athlete. I actually played four sports. I uh, played volleyball and basketball, and I threw the shot put and javelin and played softball when I went to Yale. So uh, it was sort of back in the day where you could do more than more than one. Uh, left there, went and worked at Microsoft, and in 2008 purchased the Seattle Storm with three other women and have been owners through uh, three championship teams, ups and downs. Um, unfortunately, never had Marissa on our team. Maybe that was the problem in the down years. I don't know, but um, happy to be on this panel. Thank you so much for being here. Well, I think Haley, it's still not here, but we're going to continue talking. And I want to know um, right now, what, what would you say has been the biggest challenge in your career? Um, we all know that women in sports, you know, we, where, wherever we are, we have challenges, but especially I would say in sports, Sometimes we may be underlooked. What would you say it's, has been in your career your biggest challenge? I think consistently for me, I'm like on a very kind of, you know, I'm a total perfectionist. And I think that's, you know, in, in some ways that's a good thing, right? Like you want to hustle and put your heart into things and you take a lot of pride in what you do. But I think 
seeking perfection and then feeling bad when you're not perfect, which no one is perfect, can just totally erode confidence. And I think that's something I struggled with as an athlete that, you know, I had to work really hard of like, you know, if I had a bad touch in the game or something, I could spiral out versus, you know, a good touch could send me in a good direction. And so I work, I struggle with that a lot in sports. And I, I think I never really overcame that at the professional level. Um, and that came with me in business. When I first started Just Women Sports, you know, it, it, you're going to have setbacks. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to take some bets that are wrong. And early days of this company, I would let that really get to me and question Am I the person? Is this the right idea? Are we doing things the right way? And that's something I've actively decided to say, like, no, like <laughs> mistakes are part of it. Believe. And I think for me, it's almost been easier with Just Women Sports because the idea is to bet on incredible people like Marissa, who was in the league for 10 years and, you know, bet on this, in the incredible athletes in the space. And it's, it's easy for me to do that. And so just I guess on a personal level, I think, you know, for me, it's just, it's confidence and self-belief and, you know, finding, finding it kind of within yourself to keep going, even when things are maybe not going the right direction. Yes. I think we all struggle with that sometimes. So um, thank you for sharing that. Anybody else wants to share their biggest um, challenge? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, all three of us can attest to the fact that as a, a little girl, when you first pick up a ball or a bat, you're told society is telling you that that they don't care about women's sports. So throughout your entire career, you're even though you you know there is a market force, you know people that's not true, you're constantly being told that from the outside. So it's kind of navigating those those demons and in, in those in those thoughts. <laughs> There's Jamie. Just kind of over overcoming those those obstacles. Okay, thank you, Marisa. Um, so I think Jamie's here. Welcome, Jamie. And I'm just gonna pass the mic to you. Okay, perfect. Since I didn't hear anything that was said already, I'm sure this will be absolutely flawless. <laughs> we were just talking about the challenges that they've encountered in their career, you know, as women in sports. Um, so yeah, they were sharing about that. Welcome. Okay, awesome. Well, it's great to be with everyone. And it's great to be with these incredible women. I know that there's already been introductions, but I will add a little bit more color and talk about, um, hopefully she didn't ask some of the questions. If, 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 if you guys have heard the questions that I'm gonna ask, just tell me. <laughs> so we'll start, obviously we'll start with Lisa. And Lisa, um, and I, I heard a little bit of the introduction, but I think it's important that people know, like not only were you a legend at Yale, as a four sport athlete, a four time MVP on the basketball team, Connecticut Basketball Hall of Famer, which I just think is so incredible during um, like during a time when Title IX was just happening, the WNBA wasn't in existence. Um, but then you also became a legend in the world of business, obviously bla blazing trails at Microsoft and now a founding member of the Seattle Storm. So based on, you know, obviously there's a lot we can talk about and how diff like the differences between today and, and back when you played, but what motivated you to play at a time when there wasn't as much opportunity professionally? And then what lessons did you learn as an athlete that brought into your leadership role at Microsoft? Um, thanks for the question. First thing is I just love sports. And actually to be fair, basketball is my favorite, has always been my favorite. I lived across from a school. So three boys in the neighborhood and I would play every day from about third grade on. And you know, that, that's also kind of interesting because I didn't play with other girls. I played with boys and it was all fine. Like I could put the ball in the basket. They were happy to have me there and off we went. So I think that was for me a great start to playing sports. I had a good interaction with boys and then eventually, you know, with men, we learned just to work together. And then, you know, I continued to play basketball. We didn't have organized sports until I got into high school. That was sort of the first time I put on a uniform. And I just loved it. It was like a dream come true for me to be able to play organized sports with refs and with a league and with potential championships to win. And I like that just fueled who I was because I'm, a, I love team sports and I love being a competitor. And then, you know, when I went to college, I sort of had a I had to balance what I wanted to do. Did I really want to go down a full sports path? Did I want to go down a full academic path or did I want to try to do both? And for Marissa's benefit, I did actually, I was actually offered a scholarship at Maryland. I did not choose to do it. Sorry. <laughs> not that we would have been anywhere near playing with each other, but you know, we would have had a different connection. Yeah, you um, could 
Terp. Yeah, right on. <laughs> By the way, I'm a Terp also, just so you know, there's a lot of Maryland okay. connections. All right, so I work with Crystal Langhorn. She's a Terp and a teammate of Marissa's. I'm in it too. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I ended up going to Yale because I thought really academics was first for me. And I thought I could play at a good level of, you know, of, of sports there. And I could do more than one sport. And so it turned out to be fine. And then left college and I was like, gosh, what do I do now? I was drafted to play in whatever league, professional league was at that time. I was like third round draft pick. And I was like, oh, this is not going anywhere. I better go to work, which I did. And then eventually the ABL and the WNBA came to Seattle and other than watching college women's basketball, which I had done, Washington had a great program at the time. So I was a spectator with no notion that I could ever own a team, be connected to the sport. Like it just it never crossed my mind that that was possible. And then it just sort of happened. And, and we, we, you know, we can get into buying the team earlier. But if you want to go back to the other part of your question, which is what did, how did you get here? And sports allows you to learn how to work with other people. It al allows you to achieve goals like individually and with other people. And you have to do it in a finite time frame. It's like the game starts here and ends here. And that's unique, I think, in sp unique and valuable in sports. You know, in business, it's like, well, let's table that till next week or let's let, let's review that and get some more research and we'll do it in a month. Like sports is like the game starts and the game ends. You figure it out. If you can't figure it out on the court, good things don't happen. So it's to me, I loved that immediacy of figuring out how to get the right thing done with other people as you're, you know, in a finite time frame where you can't stop for very long and say, you know, this is what's going to happen. And I think I take that forward into my business career and it's like, let's go. Let's get action. Let's make decisions. Let's make investments. If they're wrong, let's change them and let's make different ones. Like, let's move. So I think I got a lot of that competitiveness and teamwork and kind of, no, let's not table it. We got to get it done from sports. Yeah, I think it's, it's so true. And I think so many women today that men and women really, but like it really, it helps so much in the business world when you play sports at any level and have that teamwork and have all the things that you just said is just so applicable. Um, Marissa, going to you, and obviously we all have that that fellow Turt Maryland connection where you won a championship. Um, you were the number two draft pick for the WNBA. And then most recently um, on the business side, featured as one of the most influential voices in the biggest growth industry in sports by chairing the committee um, in Maryland to make sports betting legal. I'm curious, and, and it's also just interesting after hearing from Lisa how different it was for you having that representation, being able to see people playing in the WNBA, having that already have been formed, but knowing that you, you're you still at the beginning of your career beyond the competition, um, and I'm super lucky because you're doing it by joining me at Gaming Society and helping me build this company and innovate around women's sports. But what do you think are the key lessons that you can take from playing professional sports um, that you bring into the business world? And how can you take your firsthand knowledge of the existing inequities in women's sports and use it to help make an impact on the future of the game? Yeah, um, I'm, I've always been a strong believer that sport mimics life. Um, you know, many people who are athletes, you learn life's greatest lessons, value of hard work, teamwork, sacrifice, um, commitment reality of loss and disappointment like you're going to get all of those things um through sport and I, I don't think there's a lot of other areas where you're going to kind of get that as organically as you do in um in sports and you know, these are all qualities that i think are essential to to being successful in the business world um and i think for me the the key takeaways are the importance of great leadership and teamwork all the successful teams i've been on none, we haven't been the best teams on paper like the championship teams i've been on if you as in the beginning of the season, we are not predicted to win. But because we had great leadership, we had that, that team camaraderie, um, you know, nobody cared who received that credit. It was just no egos. We just wanted to win. That's why we, we, we ended up being successful. And I think, you know, that translates to the business world um, as well. So when I was, you know, beginning act two, it was really important for me to align myself with, with leaders and, and people that 
share that same vision and, and line the same way. So that's why I was really, really happy you and I connected and was, you know, able to, to join um, Gaming Society. Um, and to this, your second question, um, have my, with my knowledge and how I think that can, can help uh, push women's sports forward. For the last 15, 20 years since college, I've had a front row seat to, to see how my, my male counterparts in Maryland are being treated compared to us. We were always better than them. We were always a top five program, but the men still, you know, got everything. And then in the W, just kind of kind of seeing those um, inequities and um, discrepancies, too. Um, so really, really excited what we're doing with, with gaming society and, and, and betting on women, which I think is, is, is going to be huge um, as far as just like pushing, pushing the agenda forward and, and, and really uh, moving women's sports forward. No, it's really, it's like for me, I'm so, I feel so lucky to have you join the team. And I think we are in such a great position to innovate around women's sports and take the, the industry of betting on women, take the, the industry of sports betting rather and be able to use it to propel women's sports. Because if you bet on women, you have to know who they are. Um, and I think there's just such an opportunity and I'm excited that we're working together. Um, and so Haley, also an amazing trailblazer, someone who I know you're an all pack 12 midfielder at Stanford, played professionally soccer, um, but continuing to break barriers by ensuring that visibility for women's sports continues to increase because I mean, I don't know for how long it's, I think that number of 3% has been there for a million years, even though there's so many pe more people like you, that's incredible. That's dedicated to moving it forward and increasing the visibility um, by, so by finding uh, just women's sports and, and, and building that, tell us um, what have you made it like, why does it matter that women are represented in sport, right? So even going off what we were just talking about, um, and why have you made it your mission to increase visibility of women's sports? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think at the most basic level, people care about women's sports. Like the numbers show it. The WNBA game last night was sold out. Like the game was awesome. I'm sure the viewer, I haven't seen those numbers, but I'm sure the viewership was great too. My dad and brother were watching the game last night and like they're total NBA fans. And they like, I walked in, I saw my parents last night and I was like, what? Like, this is awesome. Like the mo the momentum is there. People care, the numbers show it, our numbers show it. Like women's sports is on the rise. There's this new demographic. And we had attributed it a lot to the post title nine generation. It's women that grew up playing sports at an amateur to elite level that are raising their hand and they're saying, we want women's sports, you know, and right now they're currently following their favorite athlete, their favorite team, their favorite league, but there's not an ecosystem pulling that all together. And so my hope is with Just Women's Sports, we can do that. We can help build that momentum and make it really easy to be a women's sports fan. So I think at the most basic level, like women's sports are awesome. These athletes are incredible and people want to watch them. And so we just have to solve that problem. I also think like taking a step back, like we know what the data shows, right? We know that girls, and it's girls and boys, but especially true for girls that, you know, play sports and stay in sports, have higher levels of self-confidence and self-esteem. They're more likely to be in STEM. They're more likely to lead companies or be CEOs or all that. And I want that. I want more women in business. I want more women, you know, kicking butt and making things happen and starting companies like the Gaming Society and Just Women Sports. And I, I want that for women because it's, it's past time. And so, for me, it's just like, I'm an ultra fan of sports and especially women's sports. It's the game that I know. And so I just want to watch it. I want to be in that world. I want that content. And I want more women in the boardroom and as our president and <laughs> all of that. So I, I think it's I, I think it's fun and there's a, a, a bigger mission as well. Absolutely. But it's so great to see like your passion. It needs people like you that are continuing to move things forward and it's, there's so many parallels with sports and visibility and also with like thinking about what, what Leslie and Rory are doing at the Female Founders Alliance because less than 2% of investment is going to female founders every year and it's not going up the way it should because, I mean, we, we have to continue to understand why and try to move that forward too. Um, but Lisa, so the storm being obviously a, a founder of a sport of a, an incredible sports team in the W, um, the, the storm specifically has been an incredible leader in leveraging the, their platform to give visibility to social issues. How has that come about? What do you think the impact has been and what risks have you faced along the way? Oh, 
when we started, I think oh, we, we knew nothing about a basketball team. We loved the sport. We wanted it to stay in Seattle. There's a great fan base. And that's kind of why we bought the team. <clears throat> and we initially felt we should model it on men's teams because that's the only frame of reference that were out there. The problem is the economics are completely different. Like, it, let's just start with that. It's just, we don't have the money. We don't have the support. We don't have the media visibility. You can name all the we don'ts, we don'ts, we don'ts. So we, even after winning a championship, you sort of look back and go, wow, okay, that got us further along, but it's like, that's not the only thing you can do. So after five or six years, we started to ask about how we should think differently about our business. What is it that we can do uniquely that might not be done today? You know, and I remember my partner, Jenny Gilder, coming back from a plan, the, a National Planned Parenthood uh, dinner, and she said, can we as the storm use our voice to help women's issues? What could we do? And no, I don't think there had been a men's or, I mean, we had a lot of causes and great causes that the league was a part of, but no team really ever stepped out and say, said, hey, we want to talk about this thing. <clears throat> so inherently there's two or three risks in that. One is the league won't let you do it because they are on a different path. So number one, number two is your fans may say, hold on a minute that we're not into this. We're, if you do this, we won't follow you. You know, and number three is your players might not be with you. They may or may not agree with what you've chosen to stand up for. I think we had a pretty good sense of our players. <laughs> We had a pretty good sense of our community. And so we kind of charged forward. And and the league, it's almost like we just charged forward. We sort of asked the league, but we sort of didn't ask the league. And, you know, we, we just went. And we tried this thing. And it was, you realize how powerful it can be. Now, it was a huge risk. All of those things, like the league could have sanctioned us. The players could have said, no way. The fans could have left. All those things could have happened in the moment, but they didn't. And so I think the success of that and the fact, frankly, that near that same time was the first wave of Black Lives Matter, where the players were really finding their voice about what they wanted to do. So kind of them finding their voice, our finding our voice, and then us coming together to say, how can we support each other? was a super powerful thing. I think if you look at men's sports, there isn't as much connection between ownership and players to say, hey, we want to all get together. So for us, that was the first step in really taking an advocacy agenda as something unique for what our team could do. And I'd say that's propelled us to taking, you know, a, a, a much stronger view. I mean, we're thoughtful. We don't we're not running out and taking every cause because we're not about every cause, but we want to have an alignment with our players. We want to have alignment with our community and we want to step out and use our brand in a way that can help sports move forward, that can help women's issues move forward. And, and men's teams just don't do that. So the risk for us is we don't know anything. Every time we take a step, it's a first step and we figure out if it works, but we love taking first steps. So we're going to just keep doing that. No, it's amazing. And I think from the outside looking in, it just feels like if more ownership groups, especially in women's sports, can be more innovative and not think with the traditional model that a lot of the male sports have been doing, they'll have bigger opportunity to change the game and to bring in more audiences and think differently. And I think it's it's so important and it's so great to see you guys doing that. Um, and so Marissa, this for you, I'm wondering, um, while there's a, still a big gap, obviously, in visibility, what do you think has been key in driving the increase in visibility and what other things can be done, speaking on like what I was just saying, maybe on the innovation side, that can help propel women in sports? Yeah, I think the major key, in, in my opinion, is the women that are involved in the sport. You have owners like like Lisa, kind of what she just touched on is hearing, hearing what your players are, are, are concerned about and, and, and really trying to propel their voices and I think social media has been another driver in that and that it's given female athletes a platform to to 
point out these these discrepancies and and, and show these inequalities, which you know not, not weren't necessarily there before. There's just not the platform for these these stories to be told, and I think it's it, it's very important um, that they're that they're heard heard. And social media has been a, a, a big driver in that. I mean, even just last last year during the March Madness with the the men's and women's bubbles respectively and that the player from university in Oregon went viral for showing this makeshift weight room that the women had that literally was just like a rack of weights and maybe a treadmill and then the men have this world-class facility and she brought so much attention to it so the more those stories are told and, and people see that I think the more people are, are going to care and you know I'll circle back to, to Jamie what we're doing at gaming society and that's another uh, reason I'm really excited about you know bet on women and, and game, gamifying the women's game because again like you touched on earlier you have to know who these athletes are if you're if you're going to be involved and if you're going to if you're going to actually literally bet on women and, and just gamifying and, and enhancing that fan experience I think the more we can connect community to women's sports that's just going to continue to propel us forward it's and it's true and that's what I'm finding so fun like I know last night we were we were joking because we both put a bet on Phoenix winning and covering the spread in the game and I had shared that with a few people that were texting me throughout the whole game because they were so into it and it's like that little thing of having skin in the game that makes people it's social it's fun it's and so I think gamification is a big part of that innovation. I, I totally agree. Um, Haley, I, I know we're going to probably run out of time soon, but I want to ask you one last question, then we can ask, a, we'll do a little lightning round. Um, you have many athletes involved in your business, and I also, I have that same, you know, shared sensibility in terms of athlete voices being so important to a sports business that's endemic, a business that's endemic to sports. What common characteristics do you notice about working with people who are literally athletes and professional athletes and how that helps move your business forward? I mean, I think for us, like we've always said, like women's sports needs to be covered authentically. There's a energy, sorry about that. There's an energy to the space and there's a vibe and there's a, you know, uh, like sort of a shared, like, I mean, energy is the right word, right? Like there's something to women's sports and how can we capture that without bringing the people who make women's sports what it is as part of our company. And so like, you know, everyone is so different and we have athletes from, you know, basketball to hockey to soccer. So like, it's all spread across. But I think the common theme is these women are incredible. You know, they're not taking no for an answer. They were standing up and they want to be a part of the change and they all have different viewpoints and they all have different channels they're excited about. Some aggressively want us to do more embedding some aggressively want us to do more podcasts and I think that's all great and I think the theme is they get it they get that women's sports is sports that these women are incredible athletes that they need coverage and attention and for them I think you know I, I know like from talking with Kelly like she thinks like a big way to you know pay it forward is to create a platform that's going to cover this next generation because everything we've been talking about, you know, I really do think so much of it comes back to media coverage, you know, and betting on people or, um, you know, pushing for different social causes or issues or that it needs attention. And we've seen that, you know, social media has been the great equalizer. It's given pe people a microphone and a platform and how can we work with athletes to just make that go further. And so I think bringing athletes on board is incredibly important and I think we're just excited to spread the good word. No, and so it's like when you know who people are, you start to care. You have to mm -hmm. know who these women are. Otherwise, it's it's very hard to have a connection. Um, so I'm curious from, from all of you, who you think is going to win um, the finals? Um, and what do you want everyone in the audience to know about women's sports before we end the panel? Marissa, why don't you, do you want to start? Um, I think Phoenix is going to take the, the WMA finals. Fingers crossed. That's, that's who I'm rooting for. Um, but I think the, the main takeaway is that women in sports and women in business, there's, there, it's not much different. There are a lot of the, the challenges and obstacles both face are, are very similar. So I think the more that those two industries can kind of bridge that gap and work together, that's how we're going to continue to, to push both, both sectors forward. Um, so I do think at time, and Lisa briefly touched on it earlier, as far as in sports, we, we use, you know, our male counter counterparts as like the blueprint. But I think if we, again, if we just women support each other, then that 
in and of itself is going to amplify the games and then the rest will follow. But we have to stop putting so much emphasis on men trying to save us essentially. And, and we, we help and save each other. I love that. And I totally agree. Lisa, what do you think? So you have uh, <clears throat> I have the Vanderquakes uh, in Chicago for the title. Um, and you know, the one thing I'd like to say is women's sports is on the rise. So it's not just like, oh, I'm going to, it's trickling. Women's sports is on the rise. Watch out. And I think people don't appreciate how much growth is happening across all sports. Some of it's controversial. I mean, we're breaking barriers. Soccer has its issues. Basketball has its issues. But you know what? That's part of growth. You've got to go through those things. Sadly, in many cases, you have to go through those things. But it's because we're on the rise and because we're a force in the world. So go hire some athletes. Go invest in games in your area. Go buy some teams. Go figure out how to help us do it differently. Because it, it is, we are here. And we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. And let me just really quick, I want to piggyback on what Lisa said as far as like hiring female athletes. Obviously, that's near and dear to my heart, being a retired athlete. There, there are so many brilliant women in sports. And we just don't have the opportunities that, that men do. People aren't coming to us with, with investment deals and opportunities to join their company. But just trust me when I say there's so much depth to, to female athletes. And I have had incredible peers. So like really leaning into that, I think, is extremely important. I think that's, I mean, so spot on. And, and because of the fact that female athletes are probably thinking about what's next from day one, they're, they have so much more innate experience and passion. And I, I totally agree. Um, Haley, your, your last word. <laughs> um, I mean, I totally agree with everything that's been said. And, you know, totally agree with what Marissa said. A lot of our company is former athletes that had, you know, zero professional work experience and they absolutely dominate at our company. So like could not emphasize that enough. I'm also a former athlete, so I'm also biased, but totally agree with that. And just Lisa, like you nailed it. Like women's sports is here. It's here to stay. It's on the rise. It's not going anywhere. This is the fastest growing industry in sports. Hard stop. The future is really, really, really exciting. And so it's like, now's the time. Get in now, be a part of it, be a part of this movement. Like this is the next frontier in sports. I love it. No, you, the three of you are amazing. This is a really great panel outside of the first five minutes, but I was, <laughs> glad that I was led into it and, and was able to talk to you guys because you're all inspiring. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Awesome. Bye guys. Bye. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Haley, Lisa, Marisa, and Jamie for this amazing conversation about challenges, about teamwork, about passion, and the link between the career of the athlete, but also the business side of it that is so interesting. And as they said, we need more women in sports. We need more women in the business. So if you're thinking about it or if you're in there but not so sure, take the plunge. Um, we need your energy. We need um, everything that you can bring to the table and know that you're in good company and this women's and this whole community is going to be waiting for you. Um, yes, we need to still be creating our own spaces. So thank you again to all of you, this amazing panel for um, sharing this conversation. I know that we all feel inspired by you. And